Before we begin episode 24 of the Blacktown Football Hour podcast, I feel it's more than necessary and appropriate for me to give a disclaimer before we begin. The feature interview in this episode discusses themes of suicide, depression and mental health. Viewers discretion is advised. From the BDSFA family, from the Spartans family and from myself directly to you, I want you to know that your teammates, your coach, your family and friends in and outside of football, in and outside of sport in a broader context, and myself individually, are people who all want to see you at your best mentally. Please, and I beg this with all that I can give through the screen, through the camera right now from myself to you, even if you think nothing will come from it, a conversation, just starting a conversation with someone about yourself, you're allowed to be selfish, and how you're feeling can do the world of good. It's okay to not be okay, even if it means a comparison from yourself now to two weeks ago. If something has changed, feel free to talk. It is okay. On to the episode. Welcome to episode 24 of the Blacktown Football Hour podcast. My name is Mark DiPoli. I'm not sure why I had to look down to remember that, but in fact, I do remember my name now, which is great. I have an incredibly special episode for you, and I mean it. This is going to be the one that, if you're going to stick around for any episode this year, please stick around for this one here. You're going to meet a great inspiration of mine, someone who has been uh, absolutely uh, through the most unfortunate of sporting situations that I can think of, uh, and the big word that I will reveal to you is in terms of injuries. I will introduce him in more detail when the episode formally begins, uh, but I will preview it with this. If you're looking for a sort of mindset to aspire towards, one that encapsulates discipline as well as looking at things in a positive light, I think you'll love this story. Be warned though, like I said in the intro, there are themes that are discussed in this that are quite heavy. Uh, This is a deeply personal story about someone who is brave enough to share it though. Uh, And it makes me feel quite emotional even just talking about it now. Please, if you watch any episode, like I said, watch this one. I think it's going to be uh, the best. I think it'll be the best one that we'll have this year. On a lighter note, I also spoke to the boys, the captain and coach of Eastern Creek's PL2 side following their incredible end of the season and the potential rewards that might just come with it. You never know. It's an extremely jovial uh, and fun part of the episode. Uh, Some lighthearted fun to give you uh, a balanced set of themes of uh, more dark and gloomy and... uh, as it switches to positive, we ended up more positive light uh, in this second interview. So uh, be sure to look out for that. It's been great to talk to them again, and you can see the smile forming on my face. My focus today is on the interviews, though, particularly this very first one, this special feature length one. Uh, it is a very long episode, I will warn as well. The results from this weekend are comparatively obsolete, in my opinion, to the message I want you to take from today's special guest, who you'll meet in just a couple of moments. You will get all the results from the middle of the episode, in between uh, interview one and interview two, so don't worry, you're going to get everything as per normal, but for now, in this extra long Blackdown Football Hour and a Half podcast, enjoy one of the greatest stories I've ever had the privilege of hearing. You're about to hear a very interesting story here on the Blacktown Football Hour podcast. I'm joined by a man who ties in our Blacktown Spartans, our BDSFA, our Premier League, and also our desire to tell stories on this platform, on our podcast, that can be inspirational or teach a lesson in some sort of way. This guy, Shia Chakal, he wraps all of those into one, and I think it's he, he's someone I've known very well for the last 18 months of me being here. I never really thought that his story was one that I could tell and then it sort of just clicked to me one day and I thought yes this is the kind of person I think you guys should all meet so he has a very very interesting footballing story uh some setbacks along the way which not many will have to deal with but those who have dealt with will be able to relate to in quite a strong way uh, and that is to do with that cursed word injuries uh and it's painful uh but it's a story now that uh, years on uh, Shia is able to tell and and use his I think you'll be able to gather this but he's able to use what he's experienced and what he's had to go through as as ways to help you perhaps if you have come across a major injury recently or if you have had something set back set you back in your sports life in your football life and I think he's the kind of person you'd want to listen to if you're needing guidance if it's not from family if it's not from a counsellor so I'm extremely, extremely appreciative that Shia was willing to come on and chat to us because I can't imagine it's too difficult to, to throw back to times where 
ambitions were higher and you had to adjust. And we're going to unpack all of those things. And I'm, I'm truly, truly grateful that he's been willing to chat about all these things. So, Shia, thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you it. for having me. I think we should start from the beginning, as we always do. I want to talk about how your interest in football began, who, who introduced you to it, and uh, where did you go first club, for example? Um, uh, my uncle. I used, to, I used to just go to his games when we were a little kid, and then um, it all started from there where he just took me one game and I started watching him. There were so many people watching him at that time, and I think it was a grand final match, and since then I... I never let go of the ball until later on. So, but that's where it all started. Um, it was all through my uncle. So he started my my ambition from there. For so, sure. Yeah. Uh, now I know of, of one sibling, of course, Merv, who or Mervin, I should say, his full name, who, who plays in our uh, Marion, plays for Marion in our uh, Deploy PL1. Uh, of course, gets live streamed quite a lot. Uh, do you have any other siblings, by the way? Um, I do. I have a younger brother. Um, he's he doesn't play. He's more he's more better on the media side. He knows a lot about football, but yeah, he, uh, he doesn't play. It's Merv. Uh, Merv actually started playing soccer at the age of 15. He never played before that, so he always had the talent. But he just yeah, I think he always wanted to watch me and see if whatever he can gather. And then now he's he's been a, he's a very good footballer. He did play in the MPL two level two, so. He's doing good for himself, so good on him. That's good, good, for sure. And, and shout out to you, of course, Merv. Speaking of MPL level, let's, let's get to that point. So you, you, you're playing for Doonside uh, in your sort of early to mid-teenage years, uh, and then you make the jump up. So talk to me about that first jump up to MPL level. Yes. How did it happen? Um, so I came to Australia in 2003, and then the, the following day, one of my family friends was actually playing for Doonside for a couple of years. And he said to me, do you play soccer? And I said, yeah. And then he said, why not come and join us? So I went to the trials. I signed. I ended up signing there. It was Doonside Hawks was my first uh, first club. I spent about four years over there. And then uh, so we started, we had a really, really good team. And we make the grand final every year. And then one day, uh, one of the, uh, I think it was Mount Druitt Town Rangers coach, he approached me and he said, why don't you go higher? So this whole time I thought that playing for Division 1 was the highest league you can play in the Australian football. But then I realised that there was MPL 3, MPL 2, MPL 1 and the A-League. So I did, I spent about four or five years at Doonside. And then after that, obviously, I had to make the right choice to move on to a higher level to test myself even better. So, so obviously, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah. obviously MPL goes through different age groups and you hit sort of a 20 slash reserve grade level That's and right. then a first grade level. So... You're, you're playing for an under 15s side. I think that was the sort of highest age you got to. What did you move into in terms of age groups? Why when you hit Mount Druitt? So when I started Mount Druitt at the uh, under 16s, um, and then got to under 18s, and then while I was at under 18s, I got my first shot at at the first grade. The the coach, um, he I guess he saw a lot of talent in me where I just had to do my part, where deliver whatever I could, you know, and then. My first game, I remember, was against uh, MacArthur Rams. And then I did an assist over there. And then the game, the pace was so quick where I said, I think I had about 15 minutes, 20 minutes in me. And that was it. And I said, I had to come back off again. But that, that's where it all started. And then at the age of 19, I got my first first grade contract with uh, Meandra Town Rangers. And... Um, it all started from there, and then I realised that you become, like, you play against better players, more experienced players. You just have to mentally and physically keep yourself very strong in the field, where that you know that every week is a different challenge for yourself. Mm -hmm. So, and that was a really, really good year for me. Where that's the um, at the age of 19, I won the golden boot there on that season. With I think it was 19 or 20 goals, can't remember. Um, and then after that, it started. That's when it started to go on the track. You know, get better and better for me. So yeah, for sure. So this is around uh, what 2009 to 10, 11, somewhere around yeah, that time. Yeah, about that. Yeah, 2010, I think it okay. was. So your yeah. your golden boot at at a very high level, and and things are looking very good. And I, w I want to stay here for a little bit. I want to talk about. Yeah. Obviously, you're a striker, and we can tell that from the from the goal tally and golden boot. But 
how would you describe yourself as a this sounds like a what I do before the players yeah. when I commentate a game but how would you describe yourself as a striker were you I would suggest you're very much pacing behind and, and, and working off service and, and, and finishing nine I times was, out of ten. I was, a, I was a very, very hungry striker. I never liked losing. So I had to make sure that I do my job at the end of the day because obviously, like just like every other people that play in their own position, and I knew I had to score goals to get the results. So, And when I was little, obviously, I watched Ronaldinho a lot. He is my biggest hero. So until then, I was watching Ronaldinho's every training sessions, game days, everything, just to mentally prepare, prepare myself for every um, every game on the weekend. But I watched a bit of Tevez as well, and Tevez is just hunger and the passion that he showed every game. It kind of motivated me more to score more goals and say, you know what, maybe I can do a little bit better, a little bit better each and every week. But yeah, it's. It was certainly Ronald in the first yeah. time. You would have been, I think, around that sort of 15 to 16 mark when he was winning the, the Ballon d'Or. So, That's right, yeah. Uh, you saw him at his absolute best when he was at Barca. So absolutely, I can see why he's he's someone you look up to. Yeah, you're a left-footed player as well. I am, uh, yeah, I t- am. Tell me about how much of a right foot you had. To be honest with you, um, <laughs> when I was in the 18 yard, I would rely on my left foot more because I knew that if I... If I get a good shot on me, about 85%, I'll, I'll, I'll be in the back of the net. With my right foot, to be honest with you, out of 100, I'll probably say 50, 60. <laughs> I try to not really. I only use my right foot more to, more to balance it on. Yeah, so, for sure, for yeah. sure. I, I've read as well from, from an article around 11 years ago now um, that you once scored a, a bicycle kick from outside the 18-yard box. So can you tell me a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so that was actually to win the Golden Boot. Um, we, there was a striker from Inter Lions where he finished, they played on a Saturday. Uh, he finished on 19 goals for the season and we had a Sunday game against uh, Schofield, Scorpions. Um, and... I knew that I had to score at least a goal to share the golden boot or score two goals. And we were down 2 0 first half, and I started to panic a little bit. I said, Hang on. My coach in the change room said, Whatever Shea wants, let him take it. Penalty, throwing, whatever's out there, just let him do it. Because we, for that season, we were finishing on eighth place. So we had no hopes for qualifying for the finals. So he said, At least let's get, a, let's get something for him, you know. And then second half, we started to dominate a little bit more. And then 15 minutes to go, I scored one. And that's when I was a little bit more relieved. And then it was two all. There was about two minutes to go. And then my coach yelled out. He's like, if you score a goal now, I'll give you 100 bucks. And I looked, asked the ref. I said, how long to go? He's like, two minutes. I'm like, OK. And then I seen the ball coming. It was a corner. I seen the ball coming. I was right on the edge of the 18 yard. And I said, i got to go for it. And then, obviously, by the time I landed on the floor, I just heard that the net, when it hits the back of the net, I heard that sound and I looked up and I started getting teary. And I ran to my bench and I remember my brother-in-law and uh, my sister, they actually jumped on the field as well. And yeah, it was a, it was a, I can't, can't forget it. Like, even talking about it now, yeah. I'm getting goosebumps because yeah. it was such a, it was such a good day where I couldn't ask for more, you know, for a striker. It was my first golden boot, you know. All the hard work that I put in, in and off the ground, on the, off the pitch, it just, you know, it's, it all started. So it was good. Absolutely. Really good, yeah. Congratulations. Thank that's, you. That's, Thank a, that's amazing. Um, and, I, and I'm glad I've heard that in, in that detail rather than just a couple of sentences yeah. on, that, on that write-up. But it's, it's so much better to hear it from that sort of perspective and, and what it meant to you from a, a non-footballing perspective as well. It's to finish, by the way, as a, as a club in, in eighth and have you as a, as a golden boot winner is, is something to behold. That's, that's incredible. Um, and, and just saying that out loud, I can't imagine how many times that, that happens. It certainly doesn't happen much in, in, in the modern day uh, either. So, again, full credit to you. Uh, that's, that's seriously something. Uh, you talked about there the, the, the off-field work and the hard work that goes into it. What did your schedule look like? Were you also working at the time? And I was actually at school... Um... I was, uh, even during school days, I used to just leave my, put my bag on the floor and then just go to the park with my brother. We used to always ch- motivate and challenge with each other, even in the backyard, just to 
whether it's juggling, whether it's dribbling, it's whatever is going to improve on us to become a better player. We're just working on and off. We'll go to the nearest park around the block and we'll just kick the ball there, you know, practicing on like, on shooting. Yeah, it is. It's it all starts from there. So, but it's how do I say it? It's um, uh, can't find the word to be honest with you. It's you know sharing something with your brother along the way. You know, it's you can't ask for more. You know, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I know that from my own experience that whenever I try to kick a ball in the backyard with my sister who's five years younger than me yeah. if she'd ever booted over it would end in an argument so i'm glad you guys did it better than than we ever did we used to fight a lot oh, i'm sure yeah I'm sure. but from we, a competitive we standpoint were, yeah rather than we, who's we gonna were both very very competitive people and i was i was always one step ahead of him and i've always make sure and like taught him the way where if things go this way maybe try this way you know i always gave him that little bit of help as well to guide him Maybe he is what he is today, maybe because of me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's all those backyard sessions, I'm sure. That's I know right. you're a little bit older than him as well. So yeah, only 11 months. Not there you fine. go. Yeah. But it's still enough. Yeah, it's that's still right. enough. You know it's what I mean? You're still the superior enough. brother. That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you, you, you're, at a, you're at a pretty big high uh, at that point, if you're scoring a, a bicycle kick to secure a golden boot and scoring goals repeatedly. Um, you know, you're around the time, uh, of course, in, in that early 10s where there's a, a new A-League team forming in, in, in Western Sydney, which are right now next to us are next door, uh, the Wanderers, of course. I, I can, I, I feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm only 11, 10 or 11 years old at the time, but for you, you know, you're my age now, you would have been my age now. So I feel like your ambitions and you're seeing these things opening up and opportunities are, are presenting themselves to you perhaps and your ambitions are changing. I want to talk about when you when you've just won this golden boot and you're, you're getting attention from everybody. You know what was what was on the offer for you? What was what was the next step for you? Yeah. Um, so on the obviously that was like I said because it was my first time winning the golden boot. I didn't really know what the expectations were going to be, and um, I was I was in you know, I was in talks with a few other clubs back then, and I thought maybe. Um, Obviously, I had to speak to my family and the right people to to make the right decision for me where I was going to improve as a player. And and I decided to sign with uh, Mounties Wanderers, Mount Preacher at that time, where they won the league, I think. I'm pretty sure they did. Um, and I thought, you know, I think that would be the best decision for me. And I signed over there. I stayed, um, I, I, thought, I think it was about two months that I stayed there. Obviously... You know, in football life, nothing always goes the way you want it to be. And um, with the with the formation and the the plan the coach wanted from me, didn't really suit the play um, the the play that I was I could give in in the game. Where and I thought I think I thought that the best option was to obviously move to another club, which they respect and I do appreciate that as well. And then I spoke with the um, president at that time. John Todd was the Blackdown Spartans president. Um, there was a few times where he approached me while I was at Mount Rutte, so I thought maybe it's meant to be now, you know. And when I joined, it was already I think it was six games into the season, and um, and I said, you know, why not? I'll sign with Spartans. So that's when the my Blackdown Spartans journey began, and it was the first year in the MPL one level as well. And my first game was against it was a City derby. It was a Blacktown derby. It was against Blacktown City. So I was like, obviously, the uh, the good thing was that not many people knew who I was. And then, obviously, while, once I started playing, then they're like, okay, here's this guy out of nowhere, this fast guy. And then, obviously, like I said, it doesn't matter what level I played. I had to make sure that I deliver what I needed to, and my always always aim to score a goal. So, and which I assisted and scored one in that game. That's that's where it started. And then towards the end of the season, I realised that I've started scoring like uh, two goals, three goals. I actually had no idea what the golden boot tally was. And just when the end of the season hit, then I got an um, offer from overseas. It was more to come and trial and see how I go. But I only had, they called me on a Friday and said that I've got three days to be there only because 
within that week, the transfer window was going to um, finish. So I had to rush everything. And I even told my coaching staff and I said, look, I'm sorry, but I can't play the finals. And they said, you know, like, wish you the best of luck. So I had to go there. And obviously, in a football life, you always have to gamble a little bit in order to get to where you actually want to get to. So I said, you know, playing overseas in front of different people, different league, even though I was born over there, that I came here at a young age, the football, the level of football is always different when you go to different countries. And it was a, uh, it was a, it was about two days of trials, and then um, they offered me a two-year professional contract, which I was really happy to sign. You know, it's, it's what you want for, since your childhood. You want to sign a professional contract. Doesn't matter, like I said, doesn't matter what club and where you're playing. You just as long as you get to that level. You know, that's when you know. Okay, I've achieved what I wanted to do. Mm. So this is in Turkey. So what club is this, by the way? Um, it's back then it used to be called uh, Diyarbakir uh, Büyükşehir Belediye, mm -hmm. but, to, but I think about a few years later they changed the name to it, and today would be Ahmed SK, which would be Ahmed Sports Club. Yeah. So they're currently in the second division in Turkey, and they're doing very well. So yeah. Yeah. So you, you have three days. I just want to go back for a second. Yeah. You have three days to to get up, and and you sacrifice. Uh, you sacrifice the, the finals here uh, at Spartans and, and, and in the MPL space. I just want to clarify from a footballing contract perspective, because you're tied up with a contract to Spartans now. I'm sure back then it was probably a, a, a short-term deal or one-year yeah, deal. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. So that's technically then you're not a free agent. So you can't just sign outside of a that's transfer right. window. So yeah. we're talking like the end of August here or the end of like uh, yeah. So the end of August, I imagine. Yeah. End of transfer window overseas. That's right. So when I did go over there, only because of the time difference over there, that once they agreed to sign me, um, I had to find the right timing to actually contact the um, Spartans club to say, ask for a release because obviously I couldn't sign over there without the release form that needed to be faxed over there. And which um, I do appreciate Spartans for doing that as well because we were so limited with time as well that they did it within a day or two, which was in perfect time for me to just sign. Because if I was late for another 24 hours, maybe I would have missed the whole season. For sure. Yeah. So. And just on those trials as well, those couple of days, you said that they, just before we got on here, you, yeah. you spoke about having a trial game. Talk to me about that. Did, how did you go in that? Yeah. Obviously, well. So I was, I was a little bit jet-lagged. And then obviously going from Australian summer to Turkey summer, I... It was about 47 or 48 degrees that day and it was so humid and I said, how am I going to play this game? But I said, you know what, whatever I've got, I've got to put it in now because sometimes in football life you don't get second chances. So I said, whatever I've got, I've got to put it in. And it was a trial game where uh, the funny thing was that it was actually a derby trial game over there as well. And then when we went up to the stadium as in the warm-up, there was about maybe 100, 150 people watching. And then once we warmed up, went into the train room, and you come back out onto the field, I could hear the drums and everything going off. I said, what is going on? I didn't realise that, that they're so fanatic over there where it doesn't matter what division you play on, you've got the whole stadium packed. And then when I've seen, I think there was, I'm not, not kidding, it was about between... 10 to 12,000 people there watching a friendly game, I was just, I was shaking. Because mm. I started off on the bench. And then I was, I couldn't even watch the game because I kept looking at the crowd. I'm like, oh my God, just for a friendly game, there's this many people here. And then it all started from there. When the, once the coach said to me, warm up, you're going to get on. It was about, I think, 15, 20 minutes. And I said, look, this is my opportunity and I've got to take it. I might not get a second shot. So once he put me on, it was 1-1 at that time. Um, as soon as I got on, it was a corner for the other team. And the minute I got on and I was running into the 18-yard and the other team scored, I said, oh, my God, this is not the start I was what, like I was, I was mm. wishing for, you know. But then I'm like, it is what it is, you know, you just got to move on. Anyway, it was, it was about two minutes to go. I've seen the ball come. And I volleyed it, 
and a keeper saved it, and one of our other players, he took this, uh, it was a deflection, he took a shot, hit the post, came back to my feet again, and it was an open goal for me. Yeah, it was an open goal, and I just tapped it in. It was a good feeling just to start on your debut. Doesn't matter if it's a comp game or not, you know, just to get that pressure off you. Mm. So, yeah, it was, it was a really, really exciting and happy day. For sure. Yeah. And, and I'm sure in that moment, and then you get to sign a two-year deal, which is a long time, uh, you know, a long time to, to prove yourself. Uh, you know, I'm sure in that moment you're, you're feeling quite good, and you're starting to you're starting to live what you've you know written in journals when you're young, and what you've talked about with your family, and what your friends at school would have gone, no, you're crazy for thinking that. You're starting to live that, and I, and I can't imagine. Look, I, look, I, I was barely good enough to to play at any high level uh, beyond local Premier League, and and even when I had a good performance there, it felt like I was, uh, you know the next Messi or Ronaldo but <laughs> I can imagine that when you're you know you're signing a contract and you can see your name across the top and you're performing in front of 10 to 15 thousand in a trial game I mean come on that's that's amazing uh, and once again full credit goes to you for, for having gotten to that level and then I know that from from there it takes a bit of a turn now uh, your family is ultra important to you uh, and I see it we've seen it I saw it recently with Merv's celebration which I'm sure if the viewers of Premier League have I've watched games recently, would know what that mean. Um, I know how important it is to you, and I, and I get that has a factor in your decision making a couple of months in. So, just I don't want to spend too much time of it talking about you know why you decided to come home, but you do come home. Uh, so, just generally, what was the reasoning behind that? Yeah. So after signing to your deal, uh, football-wise, everything was going really good. Obviously, training twice a day, five times a week, and you've got the game on the weekend. Everything was going really good. It's just that was the first time where I was separated from the family since birth, pretty much, and being so close to my brother and my family and my sisters. And then it started to kick in in a very different way where it came to a point where I couldn't perform anymore, that I knew that I could do much better, but it just... It just wouldn't happen, and and I said to myself, where after every training I would go into my room, and it's like I'm just between four walls, and I really need to make a quick decision on what I wanted to do for my future because it was not going good. And I had a I had a meeting with the the coach and the president of the club, and I said, this is what I'm going through, and what do you guys think that I should do? And they said, look. You've, we've, we can imagine what you're going through and it's not the first time it happened to players where once you sign a professional contract, doesn't matter where you are, the system is different, everything is different in there where it can hit you in a very different way. So I said, and I thought about it and I thought going home was the best decision for me at that moment. Obviously, whatever decision you need to come up with, that you need to be behind it 100%, whether it's for good or bad. And I stayed about eight months and I said, I have to be home. Obviously, one of my friends over there where he lost a family member and I, and being so far away from my own family too and I thought about it, that kind of hit me in a different way as well. And I said, no, I've got to be next to my family regardless of where I'm playing because my whole footballing life where I always had my family behind me and to be away from them, it, like I said, it, it hit me very differently and I thought... The best option was to come home. That time. This is also a time where, you know, in today's day and age, we, we, there's a lot easier instant access. That's right. With technology, uh, I think contextually you're talking about the early 2010s, and you know you can't just pick up your phone and, and FaceTime someone as easy as we can these days. You know what I mean? So even just lacking that, if, if this happened maybe 10 years later, if you were born 10 years later and then you go through the same sort of process, perhaps it's a little bit, perhaps it's a little bit different. 100%. And you look back and you think, oh, if, buts and maybes, but that's what happened in your story and that's the decision you made to come back home. So now from a, even from a non-footballing perspective, you come back home, I imagine you go straight back into to just normal life for you, but also from a football perspective, what happens? Um... So once I came back here, um, I went back to Rangers where I started my uh, representative football level and thanks to them they've 
always had a um, special part in my footballing life as well, where I've spent about eight years over there. So, and they, without he any hesitation, they took me aboard, and I was, I was always happy to sign there. And it was a, it was not a bad season. I was again in the top five, I think, with the Golden Boot, and and after that, it's just um, that's when I broke. I broke my elbow over there and I was off the pitch for about, I think it was about two to three months. And then that was my first major injury. And then after that, took a big, big, big downhill where everything started to hit me all at once. Because I never used to get injured, to be honest with you. I used to have those little niggly injuries, but I was fine within two days. But to get my first major injury and after that, it just went downhill. Well, let's let's start to talk about that now. We're, I think we're be around the twenty-five minute mark now at this point. Um, so let's let's get into in, into the difficult stuff. So this elbow injury happens, um, but you know an elbow injury. Uh, you know I think you can sort of get over that if that's, that's the only thing that, yeah. that affects you. The cursed the cursed knee. When does that first one happen, and why? Like what was happening? Uh, what what made it happen? Was it contact, non-contact? Was it? Tell me all about it. The the first major knee um, injury happened at training actually it was a little bit wet I remember and it was a 50-50 challenge where we both jumped up in the air and it's just the way that I landed my heel kind of locked in that there was a there was a little bit of a obviously when it rains the grass the pitch is not the best at those uh, conditions and then the way I landed it was just really awkward for my knee and it just pushed my knee outside and I did I did hear a, like a really, really loud noise. And obviously, to be honest with you, at that time, I didn't have any mates or, or anyone that actually went through those ACL surgeries. So I actually didn't know what it was properly. So I thought I was, I'll be back within the next, like a week or two. Then obviously I did a bit of studies about it. After an MRI, there was a, there was a tear on my uh, meniscus, on my meniscus uh, and ACL at that time, so. How long? Recovery. Mm -hmm. Recovery took good about eight months. Painful. Very painful. So the worst part is where, obviously, because there was so much damage in the knee, where I had to be on the brace for two months, and then obviously your knee gets to that lazy stage where it's not moving and it's not elevating properly, and then once you get off that, then you start your physio and your normal plan, whatever you've got planned for your like recovery. And that's the hard part because at that moment, mentally, you're not in the right, right state of mind where you're like, okay, you've got two choices. You keep going or you give up because a lot of people sometimes give up on the first go. And I said to myself, it's only once and surely I can motivate myself and push more. A lot of people you see come back to it anyway. So and I said to myself, I will come back. Like I said, I'm very stubborn as well and very passionate where I don't give up very easily in life. So I've always pushed push myself to achieve whatever I wanted to, so. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, eight months, you're saying, um, about that recovery yeah, time? Yeah, about so? eight to nine months. Eight yeah. to nine months, eight to nine months, knee braces to, you know, assisted walking and then, something that I hear quite a lot is that when you start walking again, it's, it's weird because you can walk in a straight line forever and you'll be all right. That's right. And then the second you try and deviate off that path is when things can go bad again if you're not careful enough. And then you start running again, but you're always worried about this fear factor of if I turn the wrong way or if I step on the wrong blade of grass, if the pitch is not good enough, for example, something like that, or even just walking through the shops and I step on something that jits me off my normal course, there's a fear mentally involved in that. So can you, did you experience that through injury number one as well? Yeah, of 100%. I think uh, one of the biggest issues with the coming back from a big knee surgery is the mental part. Yeah. The mental part actually plays a very, very big role on every individual because you hesitate to go into 50-50s. You're more hesitant with every challenge in the pitch because it throws you back those flashbacks where you're thinking, what if it happens again? What if it happens again? Obviously, you're not supposed to think like that when you're in the field because if you do that, then you could come off second best as well. But mental part is, I think, if, from my experience, is the hardest part of coming back into footballing. 
initially, how did you get over that sort of mental mental barrier before the second injury? Yeah. What was the key to making sure that you did go into 50-50s? Because, yes, like you said, if you do go half-hearted into a 50-50, you actually could come out a whole lot worse. So how did you actually get over that leap, that sort of needing to go back to playing how you normally do? I just had to train hard, to be honest. I realised I, I, I couldn't give up then. And that was just because of one knee injury, I couldn't just shut everything off. And I said, I'm going to push myself more. Obviously, look after my body a little bit better and make sure that I'm, I get the knee strong again. On the, obviously, because when you're on the brace and stuff, you do lose a lot of muscle size. So I had to go to gym and build up the leg again and obviously train hard again to get, get to that level because you need to make sure that your body is good enough to be in that level where you know you're going to come across, across uh, physical players again. And just quickly, in terms of the gym, I don't want to spend too long on yeah. this, but because people can look this up nowadays, yeah. and it might have been a bit different 10 years yeah. ago. But are you doing sort of single leg exercises? Are you getting, I don't know, I've seen some people get massages, not that I yeah. know, know necessarily how that would help, but it, I've seen it. Um, what, could, what sort of things did you do? If you could just um, list them. Yeah, so them. I've had a family friend, he was, all, uh, he was a chiropractor, where he helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. he, was, uh, he was also playing at a local MPO level as well at then. Um, he actually had a little program for me where to strengthen my quad, my hamstring, um, my thighs. And obviously, when you're, once you start your rehab, you do get a bit of swelling in the knee because your knee is used to that lazy stage. And thanks to him, he would always rub it out to make sure that all the swelling is gone. Then it's just every day, just a repeat. I would do that about maybe three, three to four times a week. So Okay, good, there you go. So now I've learned something as well. Yeah. So now, difficult question. What happens between one and two? How much time do you have? And then tell me how number two happened. Um, so after my, after my recovery, after my rehab, I got back into play again. Uh, I was at Nepean FC. And I, was run, I was, remember I was running down the line and the defender just sliced me from the side. And then once I got up, I started to walk and I heard my knee kept locking. And I knew, I'm like, okay, I knew that something's up again. And when I did my MRI again, it was my um, ACL and meniscus again. Yeah. And same it was one? actually on the same one, same knee again. And it was also my um, LCL was gone as well. Yeah. So We're looking at the left knee, by the way. That it's won't be in frame, but yeah, all on the left. And of course, all for right. a lefty, that's, uh, that's, that's a worse nightmare sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's rough. Uh, did you at least get a red card or something, or was it? Um, I, I, to be honest with you, I couldn't. By the time I yeah. got up, the play was done. Yep. So, there you go. Yeah. Different, okay. different era. You know I what hope I mean? it did. I hope it yeah, did. But sure. you never know these days. So that's actually a more serious injury, I would say, um, considering that it's already damaged. So again, same question. Tell me about recovery. How long were you out for? And, and what did it involve this time? Um, with this one, the mental part, the mental part actually played a very, very big role in me this time where I started to question myself, am I going to be even okay to walk? Because after your first major injury where they keep cutting the same, pers uh, same place where you start to ask yourself like, okay, because it never feels the same. That's where unfortunately where a lot of, um, a lot of plays where it's hard to accept that feeling where they actually mentally think that you're still the same as you were before the injury. But it's unfortunately it's never the same, and I've realised that after the recovery of the second surgery, that my left knee was always heavier, and heavier as in like inside where you felt like it's like someone's actually holding your knee while you're trying to play. And yeah, it's wow. just that's a that's a weird thing to think about. Yeah, because I kind of get that. Like, I, I just imagine like someone quite literally doing that, and I can imagine how difficult it yeah, would be. Yeah, it was very uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, that's that's rough. Obviously, I've never had a I've never had an issue, an, an injury like this, so I'm just trying to relate to it. Uh, forgive me and touch yeah, wood as touch well. Wood. <laughs> um, so how how long in terms of months was recovery for this one? So you're talking LCL and MCL, I think you said that and, was and ACL itself. So. That was a good one year. One year. One okay. year. Yeah. And you come back, and you, you've got over the mental barriers. 
you've got over the physical barriers to as good as you can. And I think really importantly there, you said that you just need to learn to accept that it feels different and that's yeah. the way it is. That's right. And yeah. there are plenty of situations where you just got to adjust to, to life. It might be different. I don't know, moving a house or um, a different partner. I'm not sure. Just a bit different to last time. You know that's what I mean? Right. Yeah. It is, you just got to learn new mannerisms to deal with it. It's, it's kind of applicable to a lot of things from what I'm gathering. Um, what do you when you come back? Obviously, another twelve months has passed. So you're still playing for Nepean, um, or was it someone else? No. So that was the end of the journey for me at Nepean FC, where I've realised where my body actually sits, where like it was not the same. And after after the second surgery, that I knew I was required to have the third one because there was a bit of complications in the knee as well. And I've realised. I said, okay. I, I thought maybe one more year, one more year in a di- lower level just to see how I would go. And um, so I decided to play for Marion. I, um, when Kevin approached me, uh, me and my brother, and we said, why not? So obviously my brother... He was Kevin, at Rudy Hill, wasn't he? Uh, he was at Rudy Hill at first, yeah, actually, yeah. Um, we actually did play at Rudy Hill. I only spent half a season there because I signed up late there. And then that's when Kevin um, approached us okay. and uh, told us to come to Marion. So, okay, and let's cut to the the, the yeah. chase, the big chase. So, number three. Uh, now, did, is that you said something there about a third surgery? Is the third surgery same as third injury, or are we talking about there a third was, surgery and then a third injury? So the third injury was just meniscus. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a bit of complications on the outside of the meniscal area where. It was between my LCL and meniscus where it just kept locking. And in the MRI, it didn't show properly what the actual complications were. And then when I spoke to my surgeon, he said he actually actually has to look into that in detail to see what the why it's happening. And obviously they realised that it was my meniscus and LCL. There was a bit of tear on the outside. So, so what was what brought about the end of playing days? Um, yeah, so when I signed for Marion, I think it was round one or two. I I had a look. It was a I had a I think it was a family friend who was recording our game, and then I had a look at myself. I was very oversized because at that time with my rehab, I started bulking up a little bit. Went to the gym and I realised I said this is not me. Where I'm too heavy by the time I, I turn. Because obviously, as football grows over there, you get younger generation coming. They're becoming quicker and a fast, much much faster game where it's hard to keep up. And I realised in your head you think that you're still the same, but showing on the pitch it's very very difficult. Very and it, obviously it's heartbreaking. But unfortunately in life you've got to accept a few things that happens throughout your footballing life. So. Was there somebody who gave you the advice to to call it quits for the, for the for the betterment of you and, and 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 you long term, or was it a family decision or your decision? What what actually what was the moment where you said, okay, that that would be it? Yeah, so um, I had my legs were really bowed as a footballer, so and that had a huge impact on my footballing life as well because obviously having a big upper upper body where I was putting a lot of pressure on the inside of the knee. And um, when, I sent, when I went back to my surgeon, um, it was a different surgeon, and then he said to me, he said, look, I've got to be honest with you. Uh, he said, I don't want you to end up on a wheelchair. And he said, unfortunately, you won't be able to play soccer again. And when he said that, that kind of dropped everything for me. And I, I was speechless. And then I, obviously at that when you're talking to him at that moment, you're like, okay, no worries, whatever. But it all sunk in once I got home. And once I went home, I was, because throughout my footballing life, everything around me was, it all had, had something to do with football, whether it's friends, relatives, or just everything was football. And to, to accept the fact that everything is about to change, it was very, really, really hard to accept, but I just realised that I'm like, okay, I gotta come up with something. There will be people watching this who, yeah. who have been through this, 
uh, and not even just with a footballing or even sporting context where something comes up and they can't continue something that they, they would love to pursue. They put their whole life around. Uh, again, it could be an injury or it could just be something else. Um, basically, news that sh shapes your world in a different way, uh, irreversibly. And that's difficult. Uh, and for some people watching along who might be really young, I know there is a very young audience that watches this as well, but they might not, they might, you know, maybe their destiny is to experience something similar. And I think what they might be able to learn from you is, is how to get over that. And even if you are in a slump, you're allowed to be in a slump and you're allowed to pull yourself out of it. You go into a bit of a slump admittedly yeah and i know you're you're willing to talk about that and once again i'm very appreciative so let's 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 talk about you know the the couple of months after the, the news that you're not going to be able to play and i want you to just keep talking until you get to the point where you twist and you start to better yourself again yeah so with with these with any sporting injuries doesn't matter what level of football where you're playing or how old you are it's it's very diff uh it's very um very hard to take that first step in life because at that particular moment you're not actually functioning well where you don't want to do anything, you don't want to see anything, you just don't want to do like get socially involved with anything because me personally I was when I heard that bad news from my surgeon I was I was depressed for about five, six months where I had did not want to do anything to do with football, even watching like what the professionals like EPL or anything and and one day about five six months later I said to myself I've got two choices I either take my first step into becoming positive and take something out of it or I stay the way I am now where I'm not going to get anywhere and obviously that is not healthy for me for my friendship around and my, for my family in the first place so if you are going through something like that, if you're hesitating or if you feel like giving up, don't ever give up because if you, if you change that negative into positive, regardless of what the situation is, that's when you know you're mentally already getting, going forward. So like I said, it doesn't matter how old you are, please, please do not ever give up. There's always something on the other side where you're not sure of. So... For me personally, I've, uh, like I said, after that, what I went through, and I've got a phone call to actually help out in a coaching role where I've been coaching for the last uh, four years with my good friend uh, Kevin at Marion. And it changed my life in a very, very different way where I've never got to see that side of, that side of frame in a football life and where the talks the plans you have to come up with, the dedication, the time you have to put in is very, very different and which I'm really happy about as well. I love, I love doing what I'm doing right now. You know, it, the best thing I, of this is whatever I've learned in my football in life, I, like even though it was cut short, is whatever I've learned is to pass on to the younger generation to uh, even if it helps them in a little bit of way, you know, why not? It'll just make me a little bit happier. So, like I said, it's just to help out the future, the future generation in the best way possible. So, I'm so happy that you don't resent football. I'm also happy that you, you said you were, you know, you were, you look back and it's okay to be in in that place. Understandably, uh, even if it was one injury, if it was two, yours was three, in in a sense, and three different sort of moments where you can look back on and. Understandably, you know, maybe even five to six months is, is quite a quick time to turn yeah. around. To be honest, it's, it's quicker than any of your recovery yeah. times. You know what I mean? So, it's it's extremely commendable, and I think it's wonderful advice. And I, I saw you having eye contact with the camera, so I'm hoping that people can sort of connect with you in that way because I think there's, uh, you know, whether it's um, like, for example, my sister does international level trampolining and does all the flips and tricks in the sky and 20 meters in the in the air, and I don't know how she does it, but there are people who. Uh, have injuries there that I can't even believe and it goes beyond knee sometimes it, it goes further into the you know your spine and neck and that's right uh, that's there are more life-changing injuries out of that but you know or, or, or dancers I know who are very passionate and an injury can happen there or, or something to do with 
um, perhaps how you develop as a teenager into an adulthood and it can stop you. And I know it can make people resent their sport and their passion. So I'm really glad you were open about that and, and willing to talk about that. And I'm so grateful to see you uh, in your position as a coach at Marion. That's how I met you. And, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm up in the commentary box and I, and I need the subs bench and you text me through the, the subs bench and help me with any pronunciations that I'm struggling with literally in the <laughs> middle of a live stream. So, you know, we have a laugh about this now, but, you know, had this have been a couple of years ago, you know, it would have been different. And, you know, to, to have friends, you know, you pushed away and to, and perhaps friends, some friends that don't understand the situation the same way as, as what you were going through, to pull yourself through is amazing. Uh, and I'm, I'm really happy with what you're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm proud, truly, as, as your mate. You. And I'm, I'm even happier that you're willing to come in here and talk about it. So um, considering that we're, we're hitting around the, I think we'd be up to about 40 or 45 minutes, but I think every single minute of it, has been, <laughs> I think every minute's been worth it. Um, if maybe just one more final thing, I know you gave some advice there before you, you finished up, but in terms of the future for you with, with coaching and football, um, you know, knowing that football did take you to a dark place, but also took you to the lightest place maybe in your life or at least your young life, you know, what does football have in, what does Shia and football, what kind of relationship is that going to have into the future, you reckon? Um, look, obviously my whole aim is to help out the younger generation and in the best way possible, regardless of what level of football it is, I'm always, you know, willing to help anyone that needs something, you know what I mean? Like I said, it doesn't matter what level of football. And for me personally, uh, at, that, at this stage, I'm not full, like, ambition to go, like, high level. It's just I'm happy where I'm at at the moment. But you never know what happens in the future. Depends on the... If I ever get a good offer, why not? You know what mm. I mean? So I'm happy to... Happy to do that as well. Yeah. But yeah. I think the key that you said there is that you're happy with where you are uh, at the moment, and if something comes up, it comes up. It comes up. That's right. You never know where football can take you. No, that's you know? exactly that's right. It. That's exactly right. Shia, it's been more than a pleasure. It's been an honour to have you on, actually, and I'm I'm really grateful that you've been willing to talk and talk at such length to actually a wonderful storyteller. Thank you. You don't thank miss you a detail. No, thank you. No, thank you for being on. Truly, um, it's 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 truly a. I think it's a privilege that we get to hear this story from you. Um, and in terms of your storytelling, by the way, not one slip up, not one word that you got wrong. And uh, you say a whole lot less ums and ahs than I did. You spoke about 900% more than I did. So and, uh, Thank you for well having done. me. Really but appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Well thank done. you. And uh, Right. You know what? I might even start recording as I'm sitting back down on this chair. Um, Shia just had a chat to me as we were wrapping this up uh, and before we head to the next segment about... Um, something you wanted to add. I'm actually just going to flip this around so that we don't look, but I'm going to keep this as authentic as possible. Um, and now we're back fully focused with you. Marion's Premier League team also had to go through something in the off-season from 22, uh, 21 to 22 that is... It's, it's rare, but it's, it's, it's so devastating and it's becoming more frequent. Um, I will let you go from here yeah look in uh not every day where you hear news that unfortunately where people um actually end their life with the circumstances with the hard situation with the with everyday life that they go through and um i just wanted to pass on a message to whoever's watching this and i hope there is people watching this where they um if they are going through anything mentally or physically regardless of what it is please please speak to someone about it don't hold it in it's okay to open yourself up to someone whether it's a psychologist a friend or someone that you don't know because you never know what the outcome it could be or maybe it could actually help you a little bit by a little bit where it can actually overcome that situation that mental problem that you're going through so if you are one of those people that actually is struggling or going through a mental problem, please see someone and speak to someone. It's okay. We're all here. And, so, and, you. and your, you know, your teammates and the, the people that you coach, that's, that you're open to conversations like that as well? Yeah, 100%. We've, uh, ever since that tragic moment that happened with one of our players, um, Alex Moy, um, 
the team bond. Doesn't matter if there's new players coming in and all going. We always make sure that myself and Kevin, we always spend enough time with each individual after training or before training. And we always tell them that if they've got any personal problems, please pull us aside and speak to us because, like I said, not everything is football. And we also have a life after football as well. And we need to make sure that everyone goes home nice and healthy at the end of the day. So it is, it is, it is, um, it is heartbreaking, but the as we can tell with the um, with suicidal rate for men is very high and we hope we hope that it does decrease in time and that we can actually find better solutions instead of deciding that that is that answer for that moment but unfortunately it's not it hurts you it hurts the people around you your family and everyone so like I say, if you are watching this or if you're going through anything, please, please see someone. So, Thank you. Cheer. Thank you. Appreciate it once Thank again. You. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Reach out if you need help. It's okay to ask for help. Thank you, Shia, for sharing your incredible story and for giving us a little look into what Marion has been like in their PL side since the unfortunate events of the middle to back end of last year. It's deeply personal and I'm very appreciative to be able to hear that and bring that story to you. Once again, do not be afraid to be vulnerable. It's okay to be there. It's also okay to seek the help to get yourself out of that slump. Let's get into some results that have happened over the weekend, shall we? As I awkwardly turn my page, I actually uh, stapled them together this time, but it's doing no service to me because I'm struggling to separate them because it's very cold out here. And now I'm struggling to turn the page, but we're getting there now. I'm just gonna do one more final little fold. And yes, in a first v second finals clash in our all age women's division one, Rydalmere beat Holroyd 2-1 to advance to the grand final. And Holroyd will now face Park Lee, who beat Greystones in the semi-final qualifier. Quakers Tigers beat Oakville United 3-1 in our Deploy PL2 to make amends for their poor end to the regular season with the notoriously slow starters who feature up next in this episode. They beat Prospect who actually won the whole thing, uh, the whole regular season I should say, 3-2 at Prospect to book a spot in the big show in a fortnight's time. In our top tier, workers beat Quakers 3-2 on penalties in the game adjacent to the match of the round live stream. After that game finished, the one that I covered, of course, I quickly dropped down the scissor lift. And after finishing at a 1-1 draw after 110 minutes, it went to spot kicks and workers held their nerve from 12 yards. In the other game, like I said, the match of the round, you'll see the highlights in just a moment, but Pons booked a third consecutive grand final after beating Duneside, who will now have to play workers, of course, who won their game, and that will be the match of the round this weekend. But here's the highlights of the showpiece game of the weekend. Friends, no more for 90 minutes, that is, perhaps even a little bit longer. No delays to kick off this week. It's business as usual for both, I'm sure. We are, in fact, away. First touch here for Jordan Hannon. It's a very loose one. Rivaldo has come from left to right straight away. Might try to find his captain in the middle. He looked to get a shot off. It might now. And a very good clearance by the opposition captain in consistent starting berth this year. But he's really made a name for himself in the finals. And it goes away. It might have been a touch of the hand there. Or they one intentional. So play goes on. Correct call there by our centre referee. Absolutely. Elianis has done well. Ross has done better to advance it. And Blake Skur has got a lot of pace being closed down by Hawks. It's still Blake Skur now into the box. Skur with his weaker foot to Hunter! That's why he's a two-time Premier League Golden Boot winner. Notches up his ninth for the season. And what a ball in it was by the weaker foot of Blake Skur. Those two there, assister and goal scorer, have been played in every position from 10 to 7 to 11 to 9 this year. But no matter where they play, they combine well. And early on here at, at Marion Park, Pons show exactly why they mean business. Rivaldo, who's so often been the man to turn to for the final ball, is behind us. Quakers go forward. Looks like George Panay. One arm raised by Cole Dominici, whose free kicks have been an issue in the last couple of games. It's a scuff clearance. I know Keith should have fired it towards goal. Though Keith lays it off. Zakouts. Zakouts. And then I thought it might have been looking for the cobwebs of the top right. He's got more than 10 goal contributions this year. In particular, six goals and 11 assists. Dominici has been so dangerous. Off the post. And then almost off the second post as well. And Zaruglu. Zakout might try it. Zakout, a couple of deflections. And O'Keefe needs to turn and shoot. O'Keefe to try and level it. And no, it didn't happen. The former who comes out better. And Hunter, it's evaded the captain. And to the Pons captain. Now Hunter to make it two. 
back here now. Jao Keith, what a throw in that is. The lap like into the mixer. Skur! Used to scoring. Can he turn provider? I can! Well, that was the chance. By Dominici and Alessi, and now Rivaldo from one wing to another. He's so quick and deceptive with his feet. And what a ball that is! Skur! Saved at the near post. Probably should have been claimed and held, but it wasn't. Towards the middle of the guy, and Ruglu punches it away instead of opting to catch it. They have to be quick here to try and get a shot off. They've been closed down a little bit. They're forced to go wide. Keeper's in no man's land. It's crossed in. And then Hannon couldn't get the touch. Zakout has got plenty of time to try and place this. Zakout. And it's done! He needed two chances, but the second one was so significant. And Ethan Eichen was called upon right on the cusp of half time to level things up. And Pons, having had the momentum in this first half, have seen their seemingly impregnable back line penetrated. That's cleared by Dominici on the follow-up. Dow Keith! Oh! Behind us, workers have equalised. Well, I think a shot from about 45 yards troubled the goalkeeper. And in doing so, it's injured, unfortunately, Dean Rogers for Quakers. But it's tied up and the goal is given. And now... March goes wide, slows momentum down a little bit, but Eichen's delivery is very good. Eichen to O'Keefe! He's one of the fittest players out there. And Blake Skur now hits it with his left. Blake Skur and the forces is able on the follow-up. Nixon! And what's a save by Hinwood. he be sweet, Anne. That's a very good-looking ball. That's O'Keefe on the header! How on earth did that miss? Forward, twisting and turning is Blake Skur now into the box again. Dive down by the defender and then across the face. And then maybe Rivaldo on the follow up and good clearance on the line. Dross to find Skur and still Blake Skur, still Blake Skur. Great save. What a reach out by the right paw of Jamison Hinwood who's been called into action. Flat ball. What a ball. And Hinwood didn't have to move other than getting to the ground quickly because Victor Lebby got there perhaps. Shiva really crosses the halfway line and there's space to drive into, but instead he's passed, found space, and then a dune side jersey, but they've won it back. Taylor Hunter, Rivaldo is making a run through. Rivaldo! Put themselves ahead initially, then had one against them, and Rivaldo, appropriately named for the big occasion, comes up with his fifth of the season, and none more important. I just talked about him combining the most amount of times this year with his captain in the 14 jersey, Taylor Hunter. But guess who found him? Exactly that man. Well, Taylor Hunter, in his full-time profession, is a school teacher, and he's just taught a lesson, a textbook lesson on how to feed the best through ball with the perfect weight on it, and it sat up so nicely. So and plenty of other names in there. So much experience. It's not funny. Whipped in. Great ball. Might fall here to O'Keefe who slips while striking. And Hubbard might hit it from here. Dominici towards goal. And then wide. Got past so many here. Oh, Taylor Hunter. Andrew Bullock. His first touch to find Tom Guthrie. Tom Guthrie! Couldn't seal it. Can be whipped back in. No, it's given away. And now Andrew Bullock has got fresh legs. Can run through. The keeper's out of his box. It's Bullock. He's got no one to square it to. How quick is Zwerb in recovery, though? Now he's going to try and find the goal. And instead he finds the hands of Hinwood. And wide it's gone. It's missed the challenge. And forward come Dunside. It's missed O'Keefe. Alessi! Could find an equaliser. No, O'Keefe goes down. No, says the ref. Perhaps a foul there. And Pons come away with it after some desperate... Desperate defending for the PL1 grand final. It's going to be a goal kick. How quickly can Hinwood take this? Referee saying, no, they can't make a sub. If something goes against Pons here, they're not going to like it at all. Turn is great by Dominici. Striding. Turn is great by Dominici. Striding forward in many numbers are Dune side. Into touch it goes. Under no pressure is Jay because Matt Hubbard's going to allow that. And that'll do it. An incredible game. I cannot wait for what this weekend holds for us as well, of course. Some more results now. The BDSFA AYL boys had Southern Districts on the road in what is always a tough set of fixtures, but I'm really happy with how it went. The 13s lost 4-3 in what was a great game to watch, but the 14s and from there, 
really, really good stuff. The 14s won 1-0, which is a top result for them. The 15s finally got another win, 2-1 they did, while the 16s also won a goal to nil. Really good day. It's been a long time since we had a weekend that was very, that was this good, I'd say. I'm very, very impressed. The Spartans boys had Sydney United here at Blacktown Football Park with the 13s winning 3-0, the 14s winning 3-1, and then from there the 15s lost 3-2, the 16s lost 3-0, and the 18s lost by a goal to nil. It started so well, but Sydney United just too strong as the ages got higher. The girls hosted Spirit in the final home game of the season with the 14s winning it late on in a really satisfying game. Two on it was the grass is green, the sky is blue, and the 14s win their game. It's not a surprise. It's just not a surprise. The 15s, too, they finished their home campaign really strong. 6-1, convincing as ever. Really, really top result. So many goal songs got played. The 16s also won. They won 2-0, uh, and they still have outside hopes of getting to the finals series and finishing their top four. I do believe in them. Lots of make-up games to go, but I reckon they can do it. The 18s won 2-1. Huge dubs. Great end of the season it has been for them. The reserve grade also won 2-0. Again, uh, shots at that finals in that top four spot is very much on the cards for them, uh, but they have to rely on some other results to sort of solidify that top four. And the first grade, as the ball comes towards me, the first grade went down at 2-0, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Couldn't make it 6 from 6. It was 5 from 6 in terms of wins on the day. It's not bad at all, is it? Right, on to our chat with Eastern Creek. I'll see you at the end of the episode. I'm joined by the notoriously slow starters, Eastern Creek Pioneers Premier League 2 uh, first grade team, their coach and their captain, Scott Young to my left, and then also further across is Matt Hederick, their coach, uh, who was also a former player of theirs when they were uh, at a different association before they packed up and moved here. It's great to have them both back finally on the podcast. It's been a long, long time since we've had them on. It was a pre-match preview of a, a certain match of the round game which didn't go their way and we'll talk all about what's happened since then. So boys, first and foremost, thanks so much for joining us here on this Tuesday night. Thanks for having us. Good, good. So I want to talk about the most important thing uh, and that's firstly the apology, the apology that I owe you. Uh, I've been calling the PL2 race for the Premiership a two-horse one for a long, long time uh, and it hasn't been and that's my bad. Uh, also, the club championship race and the reserve grade race has been has been one that I've probably neglected on my end, uh, and I, I've never meant to, to count you guys out of it. But to have you guys finish second uh, in in all of those has has been an incredible comeback, um, and and full credit goes goes to you guys uh, for all the things that you've had to battle through uh, and the, the limited squad, which is again something we'll talk about as as this podcast interview goes on. So that's my bad from my end, but I think full credit goes to you guys and the fact that. I need to make this apology is, is a testament to the fact that I really didn't think that it was possible and the fact that you guys did it is amazing. So that's from me to you guys. Now, let's actually talk about it. The last time we had you guys on the podcast, you, had, uh, you, you were just about to lose 2-0 in the match of the round to Tigers who were looking to take it away, and to, to, be, to be honest, and they were looking the best uh, and they were up in top. You then, I'm sure you can tell me all about this, but you then go and beat every single team in deploy PL2, um, and even though you might have lost two games, you then went and reprimanded yourself and beat them again in the final two games of the season. So I want to talk about what changed after that 2-0 loss in that match of the round. What just, what sparked this incredible sort of, pretty much undefeated streak? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, foremost, your, your apology is accepted, mate, so. <laughs> um, I was worried. <laughs> no, look, mate, to be honest, we... We, mate, we just stuck together as best we could. We we had to deal with it literally every week by week. We had so many different circumstances thrown at us. Um, the boys just want to play football. We just wanted to see the season out. And um, we never, maybe after one game, I, I personally thought, yeah, maybe, you know, we're, we're out of the race here. But then, um, you know, Matt and, and, and Danny and, and a few boys are like, look, we're, we're still not out of it. Just... Just, you know, keep turning up each week and um, we'll see how we go. But I think with the loss, we'll set it. I've said it to you plenty of times. We've never had any centre-backs all, all year. So um, losing losing our, one of our main centre-backs early in the season and uh, a few other season-ending injuries, you know, up towards about five or six, six first graders, um, we had to change formation and, and have a crack. And um, by doing so, I think, uh, with a bit of luck and, and, and grit and determination, we we just started winning and winning. So um, it's been it's been a good good way to finish the season. You know, a little bit of a bitter pill to swallow, not to run away with finishing uh, finishing first in the championship points. But 
you know, with, you know, maybe 20 to 22 players uh, every week. No 21s team available, you know, it's uh, to finish second in first grade and reserve grade. I think it's a massive, massive accomplishment. So Before I move into the next question I have for you guys, I want to just touch on um, that finishing second and why that's such a bitter pill to swallow. Um, now to give you a, a hint as to sort of what I'm looking for from this answer, but you guys at the end of last season before we got canned because of, uh, you know, because of that, yeah. uh, you're obviously sitting in a pretty good position. So talk to us in a little bit more detail about how sort of where you were sitting last year as, as sort of a reminder it's been about 10 episodes since we've had you on so give us a bit of a reminder as to where you guys were sitting last year and you know tell me about like I'm pretty sure that mathematically you'd be first if you counted both tables from across yeah I think years. I think we'd be yeah. first by a long way um, it's a bit of pill to swallow due to the fact that we finished one point literally a point behind uh, prospect who did well again in both grades and same as last year they were probably Probably the best team we've played over the over the two years. To be fair to them, um, and and they deserve to be where they're at this year. They've but both grades have been sensational. But if you look at last year, um, we were four points clear, top of the league, um, with basically 75 percent of the season done. Come into this season, and we just literally first game against Prospect, match of the round. We had. 18 players available for both games. Um, yes, we got the result, and Scott said it's a bit of pill to swallow because it's just so close, and you, you fall that far short. And um, yeah, it's one of those things, man. It's just been a tough couple of years, and we are where we are for that reason, you know. Talk to me about the major sort of like if I, if I gave you a calendar of this last six months of the season, and you had to pick sort of the major times where injuries really started to hit you because I'll, I'll be honest look you guys have an eight, have a pretty mature age squad mm. that's that's I think that's fair, more than fair to say it obviously yeah. helps how you play football when you're full strength but sometimes it means that non-related football things or injuries can get in the way of having a full team each week so tell me about what it's like not having a 21 squad when the two you're really competing with like really really competing with mm. do have a 21 yeah squad. look it's tough and you know what it's probably it's probably the reason we are where we are this year right we've played and you know for a fact it's been a Wednesday, Saturday for God knows how long. Basically every week we've been playing Wednesday, Saturday. So you can say that the older boys maybe struggled to, I guess, back up week in, week out. Um, look, I'm not using it as an excuse, right? We don't have a 21 squad. They have a 21, so they go real deep. And it did probably help them out, both clubs at times, throughout those Wednesday games. But look, man... We finished where we did, and um, as Scott basically said, it was a massive effort, and we are where we are, and hopefully we can get, keep going. Outside of the, the bitterness that, that <laughs> comes with finishing second and, and knowing where you guys were sitting on the table last year, considering how much has, how much has tried to be a hindrance, how much has held you back with injuries and the like, are, are you also going to take the time to step back for a second and think considering that we have a lot of odds against us here we've still done pretty well and there's and and there's a lot of things we should be happy for yeah I'll, I'll answer that before I hand it to Scott as, as a player um, Scott can answer that as well but from my point of view um, we do have to, I do have to take a step back and respect what the boys have done and I know Danny and Mitchell will be of the same opinion that the 20 odd 18 to 24 blokes that we've had literally turn up every week there's six to eight every week that have been doing 180, 180 minutes, minutes. Um, so as a coach and as a coaching group yes we've finished second it's been a terribly difficult year to get the boys to where they are um, but in fact it's the lads that have got to where they are grit and determination as Scott said but you know, Scott can answer that from a player's point of view, but from a coach's point of view, it's a, it's a massive effort. Just quickly, who are some of those blokes that, and credit to them, by the way, in case not all six to eight of their names get mentioned, but who are some of those boys that have really... Uh, Benny out? Watson, yep. young Benny. He's, he's, a, he's the youngest in the team, so unfortunately he's just been made to do... Um, and he's, he's, he's got the nickname Dartboard, so um, so Benny, well yeah. done. There's, yeah. there's a lot. There's Kurt Elbra, Joey Dunn, um, yeah. Neil Solowski... Um, Aaron Shivers. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna forget people. Yep. Um, Sorry, I but, know, I'll put you on the spot. Yeah. No, nah, I'm gonna forget people. I but everyone knows who they are. Daniel Arugio, 
Um, people, the boys know who they are. Yeah, sure. So, sure. Um, but Scott can answer from a player's point of view. That's from that's from our, us as a coaching group. You know. In terms of satisfaction, just before you you answer that, because I don't I don't want this to be a whole bitter episode about what, what could have been, for example. <laughs> we just but, want but, your apology again. No, for sure. No, I'll wrap it up with that. Don't worry. And I'll, and I'll put it in the intro when I when I yeah, film please, that later in the please. outro as well. So I'll, I'll double back and quadruple back yeah, over that as well. But just before you, you sort of touch on that. I want to. I want to just ask you: How many different positions have you played this year? <laughs> you just mentioned left back to me before, which is yeah. nothing I thought you could do, but you, you you pulled that out the bag. So let's go. Um, it. Oh yeah, right, right wing, right back, right wing, right. left back, centre back. Um, I think that's as, that's about as far as. Yeah, I think the I think the next yeah, yeah. one will be in goals. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like like you said, man, the, that semi final against Prospect on the weekend, I, I was playing left back. Um, solely because we had a player out with COVID and um, we had no one else available, and like we we had we had six starting first graders for for that game against Prospect, and um, again to come away with that win, and and just like the week before against Tigers, man, like yeah, facing a, a club like Tigers who have a lot more players than us, um, and uh, you know to come back and, and get the win. With what we had and with the amount of blokes doing 180 minutes is just, that's what I come away with going, I've done my job as a captain to get the boys up for a fight like that um, and to come away with wins, important wins like that, um, you know, everyone goes home happy. Um, and I, I said it to the guys when, when we were warm, warming up on, on Saturday night against Prospect. Everyone was kind of, you know, all doom and gloom, you know, like, look at all them, all the f fresh players, and I'm like, just, let's go out and have fun, you know, we'll just do a job, everyone's out of position, but just fight, battle, get back behind the ball. And look what happened. That's it, and get, get the win, so it was, sure. it was nice. Now tell me, because I, I, I want to actually talk about this very last game of the season, and it, and now I was commentating a, a, a deploy PL1 game, so my focus wasn't as much on, on PL2, but... Uh, there were a lot of things happening in club championship and who was going to finish first and if the reserve grade team won here or if the first grade team slipped up here or what happened three weeks. That's what, that was a, a real cluster of, of, of different things going on. You guys are down 2-0 at halftime against Tigers who for a lot of the season have been first place. Mm. You're down 2-0 at halftime and the second half happens and I think something pretty amazing football, so the football gods have written something quite nice. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that's part of my apology on letting you boast about this part here for as long as you'd like. <laughs> Tell me about what happened in the second half of that last game of the season. Okay. And go into every detail. Go, go from the team talk at halftime. Yep. What was said. I'm not even sure you were here. You I weren't here. No, I no, wasn't, no, I wasn't So there. who took the reins of, of team talk or whatever? What happened? Who changed formation? Who changed personnel? And then tell me what happened in the 45 or so minutes out there. Okay. Um, halftime came. Uh, we were... We were we were frustrated uh, because we, we felt we were the better side in the first half. Mm. Uh, you know, creating chances. Um, their goals, I thought, were, were quite fortunate. Um, I didn't think we were broken down too well. So that's, that's why, I, as, as frustrated as we were at halftime, we, we knew if we just kept going, we, we get one, we'll get another one, another one. Um, so Danny, Danny was filling in for the at the time, and he, he just basically reiterated that. He said, "He goes, you boys are the better team. Keep doing it. Keep working hard. Um, you know, and just look for the outlets get out the, the far left and the far far right. You know, we felt like we had a lot of space, um, and you know, getting the ball out to you know Liam Hamilton and, and stuff like that. We we were we were, we were very dangerous, and um, I think it was about five five or ten minutes in we we jagged a goal, and then." That's when it, I, I felt that it was turning. Um, mm. We were getting a lot more vocal, um, and we just we kept saying it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And you know, I think by the, the 80th minute, 85th minute, we, we jagged the third goal, and um, that was it, man. It was it was. Well, I'll throw it out there. That was one of the best victories I've had um, as a, as a player. I mean, I know with 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 all respect to Tigers, it it. I know it would have hurt them because they obviously had 45 minutes to pretty much wrap it up. And you know, we football's football. We we wanted to finish as high as we possibly could. Um, uh, but credit to Tigers, though. You know, they they had a great season all, all year. So um, 
But yeah, I mean, uh, I think you ask any player to come back from 2 0 down and to turn the tide and get away with a win away mm -hmm. is uh, it's a good feeling. Matt, what part of the world were you in at this point, by the way? <laughs> um, I was in America, so um, okay. time difference was it was pretty late in America, and I was getting some updates. Okay. So, you were, uh, so you were getting the yeah, I was updates. getting updates. Pretty disappointed at two 0 when I heard it was two 0 and then um, got the final. Well, oh, wow. it was after the whistle, well after the game when they said it was three two. So um, pretty happy. I was actually really stoked. Pretty really disappointed I missed it because um, I know how much that would have meant to the lads. Um, coming over, coming, I guess coming back from where they were and what Quakers had done to us throughout the year, they were yeah. like they had our measure, and yeah. that's f full credit to them. You know, we couldn't. Yes, we weren't at full strength, but um, it just goes to show. But uh, what we're about as a club and what we are about as a coaching group and a playing group that it's never it's never over, and you saw what happened for sure. From, from a coaching perspective, I want to talk about Tigers and games against them in particular. Now, realistically, you played each team three times in, in PL2. Um, the first two games, you were, you were down on aggregate, if you want to call it that, six yep. by six. Uh, now, that ends at, what, eight to three. Yeah. Still in their favour, but the most important final five goals were in your... Well, the most important five goals, three of them were in your favour. Uh, I want to talk about... You spoke... You, someone mentioned Tigers... You know that being a crushing defeat for them, and they've had a couple of crushing moments to end the season. And that's, uh, you know, Tigers plan for a long time. I'm not, I'm not revealing anything here, but Tigers, because they've already said it before plenty of times, the Tigers plan for a long time has been invested in their own youth, yep. and uh, you, we will grow together as a squad. And I think it's, it's, it's very admirable. Yep. But it does mean that when you come up against perhaps a more experienced team who have played football at a high level for, for longer, it can sometimes, there's, a, there's a definitely a difference in, in mentality and, and mental toughness, mm -hmm. which only goes with experience. In saying that, on the flip side, you come up against a team who are whippersnipper fit. Yeah. Uh, compared to, and, and I would say that the two games that I got to watch, or particularly the, the match of the round one, they, they did use that to their advantage. Uh, How did that change? Look, you're spot on. Um, they got us, I, I guess, both games previous to this. They got us down on fitness, tired. Mm -hmm. We'd probably played, I think we'd played every Wednesday night or we played them on a Wednesday night too. Um, yeah. We didn't win and we struggled at night this year <laughs> a lot. Um, I guess the old boys can't get it. It's too cold for them. Um, yes, they got us when we weren't at our, at our best as well, right? And you said it at the start, we were basically on a run. Yeah, we hadn't lost a lot. Of, we hadn't lost a game in a while and... We were fighting fit. Yeah, we didn't have, we struggled for players again, but the boys were up and about and ready to go. Um, and Scott explained. I think, I think we knew from what I can gather and how the boys would have been at half time, they knew where we were at, you know, and they knew we had to win. And if you know you've got to win, finish the season on a high, it's pretty tough to get over us if we're in that sort of mood. I think what I saw with Prospect, and I'll, just, I'll get you to answer this because obviously you, you were there in the, in the moment and playing. Um, I think prospect in, in that what we de declared the match of the season that Wednesday night game the prospect took late. Uh, it was less so about Tigers using fitness to their advantage and more about prospect using their football ability to just not play them off the park but play them to a point where their fitness was yeah. only reduced to a certain level of effectiveness. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to assume something similar happened in your game. Mm. So tactically what was working so well you mentioned Liam Hamilton getting it out to him at some point I know he's played 6 he's played 10 he's played 7 and 11 <laughs> throughout the season yeah. from what I've seen so can't sit still from the team sheet uh, in the games that I've covered. So tell me about what actually worked against them. Um, I think the change in formation. Um, the change... Don't have to reveal that, by the way. Yeah, it, is, it was. But... Yeah, it was just a change in formation. Um, uh, I don't think the people in the positions were the best. I mean, I was playing left back. I hadn't played that. I don't think I've ever played that position, to be honest. <laughs> so uh, I did. I did the best job I, I could do <clears throat> for what we had, but. Um, it's a very good point what you say, the, the way Prospect play, I'd, I'd, I've got so much respect for those guys, um, all a great bunch of lads, but they move the ball really nicely around. Um, and you know, just for us, we just, we, do, we, we sit, we sit and we just watch and we slide side, side to side to side and then we get that opportunity, we press. Um, 
uh, to, the, to the best of our abilities. So <laughs> sometimes we score, sometimes we don't. But um, I think, and you know, you play each other three times. You, you get to learn how the other, the oppositions play. You know, I, I, like I said, I, I probably know quite a few of their their boys and, and what they're going to, you know, not what they're going to do all the time, but I know the way they play, if he's going to turn or, you know. Um, but, yeah, that's just, I think, tactically, it was just more of a bit of a, a, a tactical change in formation and, um, and just a style of play. But, you know, like, to be where we are, man, um, with no training, <laughs> no grounds, you know, it's, yeah, it's just, we've, we've done well, mate. But, yeah, to answer your question, man, I, I think just a bit of a structural change in formation and, um, you know, people like Liam actually scoring goals this time. So, you know, I, I can't remember the last time he scored two goals in a game. So Might have been last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Throwback, hey. Yeah. Uh, now, you come to this, you come to finals football um, and... Forgive me, I'm having a mind blank. You already have played a finals game, yes. It was it was it was the game against Prospect, the three yeah. two, yes. Yeah. I just had to make sure I was hundred percent. I don't know why I had a mind blank. Uh, and uh, again, same score line, three two, but this time I'm the game looked a bit different, didn't it, in terms of you didn't go down by two and then have to make a miraculous comeback. No. Um, mate, uh, we Braden Keating was had done his hammy. Uh, in the game before, reserve playing reserve grade, you know, and he shouldn't be there, but he had to because we had no players again. Um, mate, and we sat him, we sat him up top next to, next to Baz as a 10, uh, as a striker. And he, he, again, he hadn't played that this year either. But ball went out to Liam, cut across, and, and Br uh, Braden Keating, as you'll know, he's a, he's a yes, clinical yeah, finisher. Yeah. He's scored some good goals that you've seen. Mm -hmm. um, so... Mate, we jagged two goals in 10 minutes and we've never done that. And I was even going, I'm thinking in my head, what, what do we do here now? Like, <laughs> do we keep going? Because this isn't, this isn't us, we're, we're the notorious slow starters. So, yeah, we, um, we went up 2-0 and then I think it went to, I think it was 2-0 at half time and then 2-1, then 3-1. Uh, and then 3-2. So I, I think... Mate, if there was another 10 minutes in the game, okay. we, we could have been in some trouble. But yeah. there isn't. So. No, that's yeah. right. So we took the win. Uh, yeah, Joey Dunn, he was on his haunches at the end. He played 180 minutes. You know, and he, he's not used to that sort of treatment either. So, uh, yeah. I've got to ask, uh, and I might ask Matt this. Obviously, finishing second in the, in the regular season, would a grand final win go some way to, maybe not proving, but at least validating that you guys deserve to be considered as... Yeah, certainly in your eyes you're the best team and that's a fine opinion to have considering how close it was but how, how important is a grand final win for you guys now? Um, yeah look it's important from where we where we were halfway through the season yep. um, again you've apologised um, but I'll reiterate the fact that you weren't the only one to probably write us off um, and yeah it probably does we didn't get to finish off last season when we were probably coming to our best as, again and we're, we're, we're in it we're in it again. So yeah, you're right. A grand final probably a grand final win, yeah, would probably solidify the last two years. But in saying that, we know where we're at. You can see it by club championship again. So, you know, yes, we want to win, but it's still been a good season. And it would be here, of course, and I would be covering that game, so I, I, I get the chance to make sure you apologise again. Yeah, yeah I will be. please. <laughs> I, you know, I, in, I've just remembered in the in the match of the season between Tigers and Prospect, I did say when I was explaining how the club championship does work <laughs> in terms sure of the you point did. system. I did say don't. Actually, I will go and clip it, and if I can remember to put it in here, I'll go and find the part where I said don't count out Eastern Creek just yet, but it does look unlikely. So. Right now in the Deploy PL2 Club Championship, Eastern Creek, who are on the who are actually an outside sort of finishing inside. Uh, in that top position, are on 145 points. Uh, I didn't quite forget you guys, but um, but certainly I didn't give you enough credit. But it's it's deserve. massive respect on our part to prospect, right? They yes. and I said it at the start, they've been the, probably the best team we've played over the last two years. Yeah. Shows the strength of their squad to finish first in both grades. Mm. And again, as Scott said, they're a bunch of good blokes, and um, we we've played each other a lot over the last couple of years. Mm. Squads are pretty similar, so. Um, and the boys seem to get along. We've had no issues with them. They don't seem to have had issues with us. But, you know, 
they're up there again, and, and, and they've deserved their championship this year. They've, they, they've been thereabouts, and, um, yeah, well done to them again. I've got to ask, is, is there any chance of a 21s team coming on the yep. horizon? Yeah, we're, yeah. we're, we're big-time searching, uh, big-time. Uh, we're up to our neck in just... Hopefully we'll have one. Um, we're speaking to a lot of blokes, uh, younger, younger kids as well. So yeah. it's needed in this comp. As you can see, it's, it's needed. You need a 21s team yeah, to sure. um, just give you that extra balance through on your bench. You yeah. know, you need some fresh blokes yeah. in this yeah. comp. So My final question to you, and this is a hypothetical, and I, this is the one that I told you particularly to, to prepare for, and this will wrap up the show, and I'll get you both to answer it. There, there is always a chance that... Look, first, first place in PL2 has its benefits in, in that uh, if there is a spot for promotion, they will get it straight away. Obviously, promotion at community football depends on teams that come back and decisions that get made around that. So it's, it's not locked in until it's locked in. And that's probably the easiest and safest way that I can explain it. There could always be an outside opportunity for, for a second place to go up. You never know. We could have seven teams that want to join next year and then we're in a, a different dilemma. Obviously, that's, again, it's all hypothetical. Yep. But rather than saying if next season maybe two teams are allowed to go up, I want to just reiterate, is, is your desire to still go up the way we spoke about six months ago, seven months ago, before the season even started? Is that still the same? Oh, absolutely. Going to next year? Uh, uh, 100%. And... Um, if there is a chance, that was a big driving factor in finishing the season where we are. Obviously, there being a buy in the first grade comp at the moment, if that was to come to fruition next year and they were to promote two teams, say, um, we've put ourselves in pretty good in a pretty good spot to earn that second promotion spot. Um, yeah, we're, it's, it's where you want to be, you know, and we, we're, we're pretty confident we can handle ourselves in that league. Um, and... Um, with a bit of rejuvenation of the squad moving forward into next year with that 21s um, and having the three teams, I, I think would even um, go a longer way for us to be even more competitive in that sure. first grade comp. So, and Scott, I'll ask you, uh, what, is, what does next year look like for you and, and, and the squad? How, how keen are the boys to, to, to come back? Is there a majority sort of... Yeah, there's, there's been discussions of, of late um, and yeah, I, I think the, the main, main core of boys are going to come back. Um, Rick, you know whether we're prem twos or prem ones. Um, if it's, if it is what you know what we're talking about, if there is a, a promotion to prem ones, then uh, hands down, you there'll be uh, a lot of talk about coming back, and I, I, I believe even uh, a lot of other people from around will. You know, it'll probably attract players. I think if if we get the promotion, if if that was to happen, but. Mate, for, 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 for the boys in, in, in the squad right now, uh, if we go back into Prem 2s, we go back into Prem 2s and, you know, we, we try win the, win the comp again. You know, it's the boys love it. It's the same core of boys. Um, you know, it's the reason why we play. You know, the last, last couple of weeks, there's, there's a, a good morale around the side now and um, those couple of wins that we've had is... You can see it on the boys' faces is the reason why they want to play. So, um, yeah, no, I'll be back, man. So, That's good to hear. That's yeah. good to hear. I actually kind of don't want this conversation to wrap up because I think we've we've had, like, Dune side I've had on multiple times in a row. Ponds have been on multiple times in a row, for example. Uh, Tigers in PL2 I've had on plenty of times. But it's been a long time since I got to chat to you guys about, about how things were going. And it's good to hear that uh, the, the morale is high. I think that's, that's probably the best thing I've heard. Uh, in, I think we're, we'd, be, we'd be touching on half an hour right now, so I think that's amazing. Um, this conversation just kept flowing and flowing. So uh, I'm, we're going to wrap it up here, though, because there's obviously more segments to cover. But uh, a final apology to you guys, uh, but also uh, the most from someone who gets to watch and appreciate all the football from a completely non biased perspective. Obviously, I'd never played for one of these clubs as, as a kid, uh, but full respect to you guys for, for doing what you do and, and to all the teams that have made it this far considering the last two years and how tumultuous it's been so uh, congratulations to you guys as well as, as a final apology and also thank you for, for being on here and, thank you, Mike. and being willing to thank discuss you guys. really yeah, do cheers. appreciate no, it thank you Mark see you later Thanks, guys yeah, cheers good stuff. see you mate it's always a good time to chat to the Eastern Creek boys. They are uh, always open and honest and they always chat about funny things and uh, they made me apologise uh, countless times. Uh, but I did show them with that little clip that I've put in that uh, I did actually back them at some... Well, I didn't back them, but I, I said that they were in it at some point. So uh, once again, forgive me, uh, but I'm sure you'll, you'll be fine. Uh, I'm sure you'll recover from it emotionally. Uh, I'm sure you're not, it's not keeping you up a bed 
you know, up up late in bed at, at night and you can't sleep, you know, tossing and turning, thinking about what Mark says on the podcast. Uh, anyway, I've just found a green highlighter in my pocket. Eastern Creek Colours, I just, they just keep following me. Like, I think they've cursed me at this point. Uh, so I'll give a final apology uh, when we see them in the grand final when I cover the Deploy PL2. Anyway, look, to end the episode, no goal of the week, but that's because we have a goal of the week uh, well, actually, no. You know what? I will show you the goal of the week. There's five entries to choose from. It's basically a goal of the season. So uh, we have five entrants uh, that I've handpicked and selected, but I think they're by far the best five uh, that were scored all year from our mini news level to all-age uh, women's level to uh, PL1 and slash 2 level. There's a whole different range of goals. Chip, finesse, flare, long shots, thunderbolts, this and that, all the like, dribbling through the whole team. There's five to choose from. Go to our Facebook page and our YouTube page to cast, uh, page to cast a vote. I will show you the five goal of the week entrance right now. Take the shot! That's it! Yeah. Oh. Oh. What a goal. But first time volley and a goal on the ages for a fury with a fury and a bay. It's 2 0. In the middle, in the middle. Incredible goals. Do not forget to cast your vote on one of our social media pages, Facebook and or YouTube. Do both. Your vote will count for two. If you want to just keep commenting and spam until you get blocked uh, by Mark Zuckerberg, you can do that too. I don't mind either. What else do I have to mention? Uh, yes, back onto a more serious note. Uh, thank you so much to the interviewees who featured on today, particularly uh, Shia Chakal, the first one, but of course, notwithstanding uh, the boys from Eastern Creek, Matt Hederick and Scott Young, coach and captain, respectively, of Eastern Creek's PL2 side. But Shia, for, for sharing the story that you did and the manner that you did it, the length of time that you were able to, to share it for was amazing. Uh, and once again, if you are struggling, please, Feel free to be vulnerable. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to not be 100%, but take the precautions, take the, the steps you need to, to pull yourself out of that. Uh, I believe in you. Um, I've done it. I've reached out for help before. It's okay. And it got me through. You can see me smiling here in front of episode 6 times 4 of the Blacktown Football Hour podcast. And to speak of 6 times 4 this is going to end the 24th episode of the Blacktown Football Hour podcast. We are one away from our quarter century, which is just incredible, isn't it? Up to almost 25 hours of Blacktown Football Hour content. Hope you've enjoyed the hour and 25 minutes that this has lasted for here. So um, it's a very, very, very long episode. And I apologize, but I think you uh, understand why it was so important that it was this long. Cue the outro music. Good night. Love you all. See you next week.